before that wonderful way that you have participated as we have lifted our voices in song together. I never grow tired of singing that beautiful old hymn uh, together. Uh, hopefully all of you mamas had a good afternoon, a peaceful one. Uh, you didn't have to do the dishes after lunch. Perhaps you didn't even have to prepare it. That would be ideal. So if you guys uh, made mama do that, you repent and do better uh, tonight and next Sunday and a lot of other days too, and maybe she'll forgive you, and I'm sure that's the way mamas are. Uh, they will. But thank you for uh, the kind remarks uh, that were made uh, by Frank in the opening. Uh, it's not because of uh, the preaching uh, that this preacher did, but it's because of the message of God's Word that we hold up the truth of uh, His gospel. And we want to continue to proclaim it no matter uh, what our world says to the contrary. And so your encouragement and support uh, in my efforts to do that are always uh, so very meaningful. So thank you to each uh, that were so kind to give uh, compliments to that regard or encouragement uh, to that end. Tonight you see on screen big words. We want to take the uh, third Sunday night and uh, look at some big words that the Bible gives us. And anytime uh, you're trying to impress people, sometimes you just try to keep a big word in your back pocket uh, to throw it out there to folks. Now that can backfire on you for sure. And even sometimes using the very simplest of speech can go a little bit uh, off track. Uh, Brother Paul Rogers preached for many years in Centerville, Tennessee, and he told in his bulletin one time um, when he was, I guess, a younger preacher, he had been given some sort of award by a civic organization or something of the sort. I don't remember the exact details, but he said, I was sitting there as they were making, uh, you know, the presentation that they were about to hand me a plaque or some other item to show the award that I was winning. And I was just rehearsing in my mind what I wanted to say. And I wanted to say, I do not deserve this uh, but I accepted uh, humbly or something to that effect. And he said, I got up and I was so excited. He said, I certainly deserve this and I'm not thankful at all for it. And uh, he said, I didn't even catch myself. And he said, you know, everyone's face just kind of looked funny, but that's the danger you run in being a public speaker. Sometimes you can well insert your foot in your mouth. Sometimes mine goes all the way up to my knees. Here's a big word for you tonight. Uh, you can impress your co-workers tomorrow if you tell them that uh, your preacher talked about hippopotomonstrosis quipedeliophobia. You say, well, what in the world is that? It's probably what you're suffering from tonight, a fear of long words. That's actually a dictionary entry for that idea. And there's, I think, 34 characters or so in that particular word. Well, the Bible has some big words. We've already looked at some of those big words to this point in the year. Uh, tonight, here's a big Bible word. It's an old word, not used really often outside of Scripture, but it's found within the pages of God's Word uh, several different times. The word is chastisement. What in the world is that about? Chastisement. Well, really, that's the process by which you might be chastened. That's a word as well. Now, uh, chasten, there's a C there. It's not the same English word as hasten. Hasten means to hurry. Uh, Amy likes to tell you, and I'm not going to embarrass her too bad uh, in this regard, but there is a hymn usually sung at the conclusion of our uh, time together uh, to encourage folks to think about their spiritual condition. And you remember in the chorus it says, Hasten, glad and free. That is, you know, hurry up, make a decision. Tonight is the night to obey the gospel. Well, she had a brother named Jason, so she would sing it, Jason, glad and free. Well, uh, that's kind of this same idea. This isn't Jason, this isn't hasten, this is chasten. Well, what is the Bible... Uh, have to say about this word chasten or chastisement, chastening itself, or uh, the word that Brother Elon used in his prayer as he prayed for our time together tonight, the word discipline. What does that mean? Uh, does it mean, does it conjure up images like this, of maybe having to put your nose here, the little guy's not in the corner, but he's just got his nose, I guess, against the wall. Uh, maybe he's misbehaved in some way. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about a correction? Or are we talking about, uh, you know, a sort of punitive discipline that is going to be punishment of a sort? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? How do you define it or understand it? Well, amazingly, the Bible, as it uses the term in both the Old and the New Testament, doesn't provide us at least a, uh, a definition that is exact in the sense of the Bible says now discipline, and here's what discipline is meant to convey or be understood as being. It doesn't have that. Uh, instead, we can just pick it up from little bits and pieces of what the Scripture uses to describe uh, aspects of this word that will hopefully help us tonight. So I invite you to follow along. Now, you see the dad here, he's helping his uh, child learn how to ride a bike. Now, you say that's not related to chasing or discipline, but really the Bible word is probably more akin to that idea of some guidance, of trying to learn some skill or to have some end goal in mind and to have someone alongside of you uh, to try to help you. 
Now, any of us that remember riding a bike, hopefully uh, you learned it with a parent, dad or a mom, maybe an older brother or sibling or a good friend, uh, that for at least those first few attempts, they were by your side. And uh, they would help you and you'd begin to get wobbly and they would be there to steady you and tell you to keep pedaling. And as you learned to pedal and your balance improved, very soon you were able to do it uh, on your own. Uh, my dad put me on there and his idea of learning your balance was just push me as far and as fast as he could away from him. And after three or four crashes, I kind of got the idea, keep the wheels straight, don't lean too far either to the left or the right, pedal as you go, and you'll make it. Well, uh, is that the chastening of the Lord? How does the Lord kind of, if you will, walk beside of us? How does He guide us? Well, that's kind of what the Word has in mind, but here are some aspects of it that will help us get it more clear. Job chapter 5, uh, Job is told by his friend who is trying unsuccessfully of sorts, and he's not alone in this regard. Two other friends do the same, but Eliphaz is telling Job, you know, Job, you need to consider uh, that maybe what you're going through, it could be something beneficial. Now, it's true that these friends said that the causation of Job's troubles was his sin, and that's a dangerous mistake to make, but here at least Eliphaz is correct in saying, happy is the man, the person whom God corrects. Now, Job didn't really need correction, per se, for a specific sin. Uh, it may have been that, of course, the wager between Satan and um, God had been such of a high magnitude that Job is the case study. And so God allows Satan to test Job in a very, um, a very tough way, a very challenging way. You might know that backstory, of course, from reading the first few chapters. But happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore... Do not despise the chastening, there's our word, of the Almighty. This is an old concept. It's thought that Job may have been a contemporary of Abraham. There are some that suggest he might have even lived prior to the flood in another part. I know he's not in the genealogies mentioned in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. Might have been a contemporary of Abraham. We don't really know where he fits into the Bible story, but it's a very ancient idea. Don't despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he, here Eliphaz speaks for God, God bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. In other words, there is a purpose to the difficulties in life. And yes, tonight we're maybe skirting around the fringes. We're not going to hit it head on tonight. But we are skirting around the fringes of those questions such as, why do bad things happen to good people? You've asked that because you say, I'm a good person. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. And yet bad things come into my life or into the life of those that I love. And that just doesn't seem fair. We're skating around the same concept on how is there a good God who's all-powerful and yet evil exists. The problem of pain and suffering. Good things uh, happening to bad people and bad things happening to good people, I don't understand. We won't address that head on tonight, but maybe this gets us at least going somewhat in the direction of it. Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses tells uh, that second generation whose parents and grandparents had died in the wilderness, now you stand on the doorstep of the promised land, now you can go in. But you need to understand this. As a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Now he's talking about that prior 40-year period in the wilderness. And God had taken care of them. They were wearing the same clothes and the same sandals that they left Egypt in. And there was a reason why God had cared for them to test them. Not tempt, but yes, to test. To see if their faith was genuine or not, so you shall keep. He tells them in verse 6, the commandments of the Lord your God. He's going to bring you into a good land, but until he does that, realize that God is chastening you. Psalm 6, as well as Psalm 38, the first verse of each of those psalms, the psalmist makes a plea to God. And in his prayer, we can understand the request he is making. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Child psychologists will tell us that you know, if I am going to punish a child for some act of disobedience, uh, it does little good if I'm out of control of my own anger. Uh, if I do that uh, just out of spite, or in even some sense, as foolish as it sounds, to get some sort of retribution or revenge, my child has disobeyed. They violated my authority as the king of this castle, so I'll show them who's boss. I'm the daddy. Well, I've made that mistake, and I've begged forgiveness more than once for such foolishness. But here, understanding that tendency maybe that we as earthly parents have to sometimes not exercise discipline in a loving, corrective, proper fashion, thing that maybe God is the same way, the psalmist said, 
And if it be David, don't rebuke me in your anger. God, understand that if you are to chasten me, please let it not be here his terminology in your hot displeasure. It's really a plea for mercy. It's a plea for understanding. And certainly God is the perfect Father who in his chastening will never do it in an anger, vindictive sort of fashion. But we'll do it always in love and do it in a kind and compassionate way because he is gracious and merciful. Solomon tells his son in Proverbs 3, and what a needed instruction that chapter has. Um, I always uh, think about this chapter. It's graduation season. Verse 5 and 6 is still the best graduation maybe advised for uh, any graduate, no matter from kindergarten or high school or a Ph.D. program, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him, God, and He'll direct your path. That's verse four, uh, or verse 5 and 6. If you jump down to verse 11, he continues along that same line, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest His, God's, correction. Why? Here's the reason for it. He gives explanation. Whom the Lord loves, He corrects. You want God to love you? I mean, that's a simple question, isn't it? Of course I want God to love me. Whom the Lord loves, He corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom He delights. We'll revisit this in a moment. Same book in chapter 19, verse 18, this time written to earthly parents. Here the warning is given. Chasten, discipline your son. I think daughters fit into this category of instruction as well. But here, maybe boys are more hard-headed. Chasten your son while there is hope. Do not set your heart on his destruction. There's a time, and parents, you know, like Amy and I are realizing more every day, that time quickly and rapidly passes by. So we have a time to walk beside of them. Yes, they'll still always be our children, but there's a brief period of time when we can help guide and correct. And then we have to let the bicycle go. Then they have to pedal on their own. Then they're responsible for the crashes or accidents along the way. And so we want to try our very best to do our very best in this process of parenting, which includes this chastening, discipline, guidance um, that the Bible enjoins upon us. Well, that's kind of an Old Testament survey. Go to the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12. That may have been where you thought we would start, but that's where we want to spend the remainder of our time together tonight, thinking about discipline. Uh, because verses 4 to 11 have the most extensive discussion of this topic of anywhere in Scripture and certainly anywhere in the New Testament. What do we mean by the discipline, the chastening, the chastisement of the Lord? Well, Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 4, the Hebrew writer addressing his readers, he said, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. The same reading from Proverbs 3 we noted a moment ago. Continuing in verse 7, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, if you recall the context of the book of Hebrews, it's written to a group of Christians with a Hebrew, with a Jewish background or heritage. Some of them may have been Gentiles who proselyted uh, to uh, Judaism and then later became Christians, but it seems likely that by and large most of these readers that this book was addressed to were first, of course, adherents of the law of Moses. Now they have heard the gospel, now they have obeyed Jesus. But due to persecution, whether from their fellow Judaizer, uh, Judaizers, that's the term used in the book of Acts to describe these very zealous for the law of Moses who chased Paul from place to place, uh, that you recall, or if it might have been the increasing persecution from uh, societies in Rome and uh, Greece and various other places throughout the Mediterranean world, uh, they were wavering. And uh, that's clearly evident with the warnings that you see throughout this volume. They were tempted to turn back, to give up, 
uh, to go back to Judaism. That was safe. It was a legal religion. Christianity was an illegal religion in the first century. And so the Hebrew writer is writing to them, and now nearing the end of the epistle, he says, you need to look to Jesus. We have the cheering section of chapter 11, the Hall of Fame of Faithful Ones. Now Jesus is, as it were, at the finish line, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12. You need to go on. You need to finish your race. Don't give up. Don't go grow weary or discouraged. Keep running. Live life faithful to Christ to the very end. And now beginning in verse 4, uh, he says something that almost can almost smack of uh, just a disrespectful observation. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. You think you've got it bad? Now today, we sometimes bemoan our lot in life. We talk about the ridicule that we face, maybe from co-workers. We talk about how our neighbors, maybe we hear them across the fence talking uh, about us and how silly it is that we go to church every Sunday. Or maybe uh, we've got other family members that don't understand why we live the Christian life. And woe is us and things are bad and terrible. The Hebrew writer would probably tell us the same thing he told these readers. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed. If you jump back in the previous chapter to verse 35, uh, really even before that actually, uh, to verse 34, here's what faithful ones in the past had to do. They escaped the edge of the sword. They had to accept torture, uh, and they were tor tortured, not even accepted deliverance if it should come. Uh, they were scourged, they were mocked, they were in chains and imprisonment. Uh, verse 37, it's not a magic show, look at what it says. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. Now, that's not when the magician brings you on stage, you know, and he cuts the woman in half and then he puts her back together. These were Christians, these were followers of God in the past, in history. That's how they met their demise. And all of these, they have not yet given up, or they did not give up having obtained a good testimony. They continued on. So we should do the same. Now, uh, within that context, then, our discipline by God or our adversity that God might bring our way or our chastening seems to pale in comparison, to be quite honest. And the difficulty we have is probably assigning a value or assigning a correlation to exactly what is meant. For instance, if I receive some sort of health news and I'm about to have a difficulty, you know, with a pending illness or a disease, is that the chastening of God? Perhaps. If I am uh, working and have been a good employee, but now the boss says, you know, we're downsizing, so here's your pink slip, uh, good luck to you, is that the chastening of God? Perhaps. Uh, is it any number of other things that are setbacks in life or downturns or other uh, things that we would rather not experience, but yet here they are dumped on our doorstep. What do we do with them? Well, the Hebrew writer doesn't give us any guidance as to all of these things that we might face and whether or not they are from God or just uh, the simple fact that we live in a world where sin and the evil one continues to hold sway and we are in constant conflict with him. So I don't know. And yet uh, the Hebrew writer says, whatever you face, it's not bloodshed. And interestingly, he would probably go on to add, even if it means shedding your blood. If persecution rises to that level of intensity, that doesn't mean you stop then either. You keep going. You've forgotten, verse 5, a common thought throughout this epistle. He tells them to remember, to recall. So to not remember, verse 5 and 6, the chastening of the Lord. It comes because God loves you. It comes because God identifies you as His children. If you're not one who is disciplined by God, you're illegitimate. Now verse 8, if you're looking especially at the King James or even maybe another older version, I don't remember exactly the, uh, here the verbiage that the American Standard uses. There's a word that uh, probably would be quite shocking, but that's the word that he uses for illegitimate. Uh, it's a word that means you don't belong to God. These earthly fathers, they did correct us, and they did it for our benefit. So here's the question for tonight in this time that we have remaining. How do we respond to this chastening of whatever type or form it may come? How do we respond? What do we do? Let me give you just a few ways in which we might choose to respond, and uh, some of these are the improper way to respond. Then we'll notice some ways in which we should respond. Uh, first, we can respond with reluctance. This is what I might call dejected acceptance. Reluctance or dejected acceptance. It's the individual who has self-pity. You ever met that individual? That no matter what's happening in your life or anyone else's life, it's always worse than their life. You've met that person. Um, and uh, that person is generally not the most 
enjoyable person to be around. And um, unfortunately, I, and um, again, my family would, some of my family would deny it, but the ones that are guilty are the ones that would deny it, uh, that they're guilty of it. Uh, you know, they're just always something, no matter what, uh, something is worse in their life than whatever it might be in yours. Nobody suffers like I do. I have it worse than everyone else. And that's the way that uh, they often want to present uh, their lot in life to you. And they expect you to have at least a listening ear and maybe some sympathy for them. Uh, but that grows very wearisome very quickly. Uh, so there might be what we would call a reluctance to chastening or discipline, a dejected acceptance. Uh, number two, closely akin to that, there is resignation. And this is a defeated acceptance. And what we mean by that is, well, you know, this is my lot in life. You know, nothing ever goes my way. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, that there's no purpose or meaning in anything. The universe is just this cold, mean place. Uh, it's really the idea that the Stoics advocated in the first century. Uh, it's the British stiff upper lip, if you've heard that expression before. It's just that I've just got to accept it. And um, it's just the simple uh, fact of the matter. There's no meaning or purpose in any of it. I'm going to be stoic about it. I'm not going to show any emotion. Uh, I'm just going to endure, if you will. Now, that sounds a little bit more Christ-like, if we want to even use that sort of terminology. We think, well, accepting it. Uh, but if you'll notice, if you read the Gospels closely, Jesus had emotions. He had feelings. And he would respond in anger. He would respond in frustration. He would respond in sadness, uh, depending on what he had encountered. So uh, this idea that I don't need to have any feeling at all and I'm just going to resign myself to whatever it is, uh, that's not a biblical approach to God's chastening. Number three, there is another R word, to uh, D and an A word. There is rapidity or the defiant acceptance. Uh, this is the individual that says, okay, this is not good. I don't like it, but let's get it over with. Let's move on. Let's get back to normal just as quickly as possible. No more uh, interruptions. And interestingly, uh, as I prepared and tried to plan and think about this, uh, that might be unfortunately where a lot of us kind of found ourselves somewhere in the middle of 2020. And if we didn't have that feeling, you know, sometime around May of 2020, uh, certainly by the time May 2021, last year came along, that's what we were clamoring for. Let's get back to normal. Let's get this over with. Uh, but was there any benefit? Now, I'm again, not saying that the death and uh, harm that came uh, through the COVID pandemic were good things, not at all. Uh, but was there something in there even that we could learn? We want to talk about its origin, and I'm not just talking about the physical, earthly origin of it. Is there something even more beyond that? God's plan, the devil's plan? I, I don't know. I cannot say. Uh, but I do know that sometimes chastening, sometimes uh, the difficulties we encounter, we just try to defy it and we try to uh, get through it. When maybe a better approach would be to stop and say, okay, this is what it is and I, I don't like it. Yes, I'm a little bit reluctant or resigned to the fact, but is there something to learn in this process? Let me give you another idea. There is resentment. That's an approach to chastening. And this is the distorted acceptance. This is the individual who says, I'm being punished. God doesn't love me or care for me or my situation. More than once, someone's knocked on the office door and they come in and say, can I talk to you? Sure, you can talk to me. Well, let me tell you what's going on in my life. And they proceed to, in fact, spill out a sad story. And when they ask, and they usually do pause at some point, uh, in the delivery of it. Now, what do you think about that? And as I start to open my mouth, they say, I know what it is. God's punishing me. God hates me. And I try to open my mouth again. No, it's just uh, I've done too many bad things or I'm such a sinner or it was because I grew up in this environment. And they never, you know, leave any room for anything other than that. Christians and non-Christians alike. I'm being punished. God doesn't love me or care for me and uh, my situation. And clearly, turning to Hebrews chapter 12 shows that nothing could be further from the truth. God, yes, corrects us, and He loves us, and that's why He does what He does. But then there is, and this is where I would hope we would maybe kind of arrive at, finally. And this isn't the maybe spot that you thought we would land, but here we are rejoicing. There is delightful acceptance chastening and discipline, delightful acceptance. That is that God loves me as His child. I know that. He is in control and helps and teaches me in all that I encounter in life. 
That's where the Hebrew writer tells you to come down. Look again with me, uh, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 12. If you endure chastening, now that word for if you endure, uh, that's the way the New King James translates it. There's a little bit of difficulty uh, with how that should be rendered. Some versions say, if you endure chastening. Other versions say, enduring chastening. That is, that it's not a conditional sort of thing, but rather it's because you endure it that God deals with you as sons. Not a condition, but a cause. Dealing with chastening then shows God that you're willing to be His child. I know there are other things involved in faithfulness. We think of Christian duties and responsibilities. Uh, but what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Really, it's a matter of trust. If you're without this chastening, you're illegitimate. Again, we talked about that in verse 8, and not sons. We had earthly human fathers. They corrected us. Probably mom got in on that action too. She did at my house. We paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Now there's a concept there. The Father of spirits is the one that's in control. The one who guides our lives and has the capability not just to guide my life, but the universe and all of its workings. So that's much more significant than what my dad and mom did. They indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. Parents take note of that. Have you ever felt like a failure as a parent? Uh, probably most of us have. We've all been in that club at one point or another, and maybe many times, uh, depending on the exact situation our children or we were facing at the moment. But here the Hebrew writer gives us a bit of reprieve. He said, doing your best. Doing your best. That's what we've told our boys. We're doing our best. Are we doing it the exact, perfect, right way? Probably not. We're doing our best. The Hebrew writer takes note of that. They chastened us as seemed best to them. We have the best of intentions. We're doing the best we can. But notice, please, the transition, verse 10. He, pronoun usage, in reference to God, for our profit. For our profit. It accrues to our account on the positive side of the ledger. It truly does bring benefit. And here's the reason what it brings benefit in or how it brings benefit to us, that we may be partakers of His holiness. There are just little phrases and expressions and concept in Scripture uh, that just amaze me. And I don't know, uh, maybe you've had this same experience, just something that tries to find a lodging in your mind to try to wrap your brain around it just is impossible to do. Uh, studying this, it just it lodged in my brain, but I can't wrap my mind around it. God wants me to be a sharer of His holiness. What does that mean? It means much more than what I can fully grasp. But as holy and awesome and as mighty as God is, as perfectly pure and righteous, God wants me to share that. That's what He tells me. Amazing concept. Now here's verse 11. Here's that delightful experience. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful. This is the old adage when dad tells you what? This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And you're foolish enough if your name's Alan Judd to say, then why am I crying and you're not? That's not the right thing to say. But that's what we think, right? We've all had that little thought run through our minds. Uh, Mom, dad said this is going to hurt them, but it's funny, the switch or some other form of discipline, as we just typically relegate it to those uh, limited expressions of correction, that's what happens. But here the Hebrew writer is much more broad in our understanding. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. But afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That peaceable fruit of righteousness. I, I know I'm doing the right thing. I know I'm serving God. I know God is my Father and that He loves me. And Whatever life throws in my lap, I'm going to be okay with it because He's there beside of me to help me and to guide me. So, which of these, which of these is your response to chastening or the discipline of God uh, tonight? Reluctance, resignation, uh, rapidity, resentment, or rejoicing? A lot of R's there for sure. But maybe that'll help you look at them. And looking down at that last list, it's rejoicing, uh, which helps us even in the difficult times, even in the troubling times, even when uh, the unexpected and the unexplainable happens. Uh, yes, not all things are good, but by God's uh, grace and by His power, He can work them together for good. You see, we touch on a wide variety of topics, providence and other things included, but the chastening of the Lord. Now, 
Uh, if I were to show you a picture like this and just uh, ask you uh, this question, what would you think of a 49-year-old man kicking a 19-month-old so severely that she suffers a head injury? She, uh, she's kicked down a ravine by a 49-year-old man. Uh, you'd say, well, that kind of man, he sounds like a monster. He needs to be arrested and charged for abuse. Well, that's exactly what this man, Robert Moore, did. Her name uh, is little Emily Marshall. It happened on May 12, 1998 in Lafayette, Indiana. You see, Mr. Moore here, Robert, was his first name. He was a locomotive engineer. He had a diesel locomotive that was pulling 96 cars down the rail line. When he crossed or came around a bend and looked down the tracks to see little Emily playing right in the middle of them. He immediately applied the brakes and told his um, helper there, I don't know what you call them in trains, not a co-pilot, but maybe co-conductor there, uh, to continue to apply the brakes at full strength, which they did. But pulling 96 cars, train cars, uh, they estimated that that train probably weighed about 12.6 million pounds. That's how much they were pulling. And they slowed down, but little Emily got closer and closer and closer. And when he got about within a football field of her, his co-conductor told him they were down to 10 miles per hour. But he knew he'd been doing this over 25 years. They still only had a football field of length between uh, the train and, and little Emily. The train wasn't going to stop in time. And so he told his co-conductor what he was going to do. He climbed to the front of the train. He didn't have time to outrun the train, he thought, to get to her. But he stood on a little ledge. Some of you have seen these diesel locomotives and the little walkways that they have to the front of them. And he went to the front of that diesel locomotive and as it continued to try to grind to a stop but remember a 19 month old uh, confronted with a 12 million pound machine you know who's going to win that every time and right as he came right up to her he kicked her like a football off the track and down the ravine and saved her life now do we want to arrest him anymore of course not we want to applaud him and he was and uh, here's the happy picture that was taken a couple of days uh, later you can still see little emily's abrasion there and her laceration uh, on the top of her little head she needed a kick to get out of danger and i'm telling you tonight sometimes god needs to give me a little kick to keep me out of danger sometimes god needs to help me have a little correction in my life to always know how he does that and when he does that what measure or means he uses to do that i don't but i'm thankful the Bible tells me that God chastens me because he loves me as his son. Tonight I want to tell you God loves you and he chastens you as his son or daughter. And if you continue to trust him and walk faithfully with him, he'll help you, keep you from danger. He'll help keep you uh, on that road that leads toward eternal life, heaven above. We hope tonight that that chastening, even that you may be experiencing currently, won't be a source of discouragement to you, but will be something that even helps you to continue to be what God would have you to be. Tonight, are you a child of God? It's a simple question, but one of utmost importance. We talked about this morning doing what we do for mama, so to speak. And mamas can play that card. They can play it every day of the year. And uh, I don't hesitate uh, to respond uh, when either Amy or my mama, you know, sometimes ask me. I may not always want to do it, but they're mama. What they've went through for us. Well, uh, God, in a far greater way, anything that He asks of us, why should I delay in doing what He wants me to do when I understand what He's done for me through His Son, Christ Jesus? Do you believe the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross in your place for your sins, not His own? Uh, there's a wonderful passage, and you know it, and you probably would be uh, accusing me of being amiss if I didn't go back to it. And so let's look there just very briefly in Isaiah 53. And I'll go ahead and tell you even this is something that, again, in my feeble mind cannot be fully comprehended. But in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, years, even centuries before his birth, Isaiah says about our Savior, Surely He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our do you notice you don't have to be an english major to notice the difference between the pronoun usage what jesus did and how it benefited me and not him how it benefited you and not him we esteemed him stricken smitten by god and afflicted he was wounded for our for my if you want instead of taking the plural our just make it my for my transgressions 
He was bruised for our, for my, for your iniquities. There's our word. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. The chastisement for our peace. It's, it's a term, it's a phrase. I think I've got a, somewhat of a grasp on what it means, but it's far grander probably than even what I could imagine. The chastisement, the correction, the discipline that I needed to have peace in some way, Jesus experienced. Maybe the best summary was a very short one. One commentator says, Jesus on, uh, on the cross went through hell so I wouldn't have to. Simple enough, maybe accurate enough as well. By His stripes we are healed. Well, the rest of the chapter is yours and you know it. Respond to that love, the gospel uh, tonight. Put the Lord on in baptism. Let Him wash away your sins, expressing your faith and repenting. And then being buried with Him, you'll have your sins washed away. As a child of God, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. I, I don't know what it looks like in your life. If you want to talk about it, pray about it, we'll gladly do that with you. It may just be a heavy burden you're bearing, uh, a discouragement that you're facing. But the Lord chastens those that He loves. And if you're not living faithful to Him, then use that chastening maybe even to say, I need again to walk in His love. We'll help you do that by praying with you this evening. Let us help you if we can come as we stand, as we sing together.